Broadway's my beat. From Times Square to Columbus Circle. The gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway, it's the journey you have to make, because all the other streets you ever walked never paid off. But Broadway's different. It twists you into the nighttime, and you whirl your puppet dance with the spinning lights. It rocks you and throws you up in the air and beats you against the wall. And you can't quit because Broadway never does. That's how it is on Broadway. My beat. People go to wrestling matches for a variety of reasons. For a change of pace from their own domestic strangleholds. For laughs. For motives which make footnotes in textbooks. And at the bout between Max Magnificent and the Panther Man, the faces and the reasons were up to par. I was there because pressure from upstairs ordered me to be there. They said a man was there who was trying to keep a big secret. They said to drop everything, to see him right now. Right now he was sitting on the aisle near the tunnel entrance. I walked up to him and nodded. What do you want, Danny? Just talk, Melvin, that's all. I'd like to watch this Max Magnificent, Danny. He's... The first fall's not due for ten minutes yet. You'll be back before then. Come on, we can talk in the tunnel. All right. Well, what do you want? Julie Dixon. What about her? What about her? Forget you're a big criminal lawyer, Melvin. Make believe you're not quibbling in a courtroom. Make believe there's just you and me. Where's Julie? Forget it, Danny. You know better than that. Forget it. I can't do it that way. The papers are screaming about a Cinderella girl named Julie Dixon. They waste a lot of type about a poor, poor girl getting engaged to a rich, rich lawyer named Alex Melvin. You. Now Julie's gone. In a puff of smoke, they say. Today they've coined a new phrase. Foul play. She's around. She'll be back. Maybe. Only the foul play phrase bothers the police department. You going to help us? Danny. Danny, forget it, huh? Lay off. I'll find Julie. I've got friends. That's why I've got to say it again. Danny, lay off. I mean it. Uh Uh-uh. Cinderella girls are always public property. And the public's screaming. I thought you'd help, Melvin. Now it's got to be done my way. My way was to a penny arcade on Broadway. And the sharpest little stool pigeon I had, named Marty... I told him to sing it around that I knew a lot about Julie Dixon's disappearance. But I was primed to make an arrest. And with Marty saying the words I'd put in his mouth, someone might believe them. And that someone might make a move. And I needed that to help me find a lost, strayed, or stolen Cinderella girl. At headquarters, I waited for Marty's call. And I fell asleep waiting. And then a bell exploded. At two o'clock in the morning, it couldn't stand it anymore, and it exploded. Danny Clover speaking. Marty? No, it's not Marty. I'm inviting you to a party, Danny. Want to come? Who is this? A girl. Pier 38. East River, Danny. 3 a.m. an hour from now. You're the guest of honor. It's for Julie Dixon, the party, so you'll make it, huh, Danny? All alone? Wouldn't go any other way. Thanks. I didn't wait for three o'clock. I left for the East River docks right away. Maybe I was going to be a little early, but I was being a little eager. Pier 38 occupied about 50 front feet of the darkness and lent its own quality of shadows to it. Toward the river, a couple of tugs huddled together. To my right and left, equipment shacks. I should have been looking toward the stern, because that's where it came from. I beg your pardon. Come, 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 come. Wake up. I say you're quite unintelligible, you know. 
Now, there, now, open your eyes. <sighs> now, then, isn't that better? Good morning. Huh? I said good morning. I greeted you. Oh, I greet you. Good morning. Good morning. Where's all this greeting taking place? At the Ashton Hotel, room 312, New York City. And you're... Rupert. Rupert. How did I get here, Rupert? I found you on Pier 38. Did you hit me first on the back of the head, Rupert? Oh, no, 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 no. But I did kick you. That is, I stumbled over you. That's what made me know you were there. I brought you here in a cab. What were you doing on Pier 38, Rupert? Well, sir, every night, every night after the matches, I go to the waterfront and look toward England and make a wish... The same wish, sir, that I was back in Crofton on Willow. Why aren't you back there, Rupert? Because I'm not. Max Magnificent doesn't wrestle in England until the summer. Max Magnificent? Yes, of course. I'm his valet. I spray the ring for him, carry his robe. Rupert. Where's Max? The Magnificent is in the next room, having his hair done. Thanks, Rupert. Uh, will you be staying to breakfast, sir? Kipper's in ten minutes. Well, well, I see you're up and around. Glad to see it. Max Magnificent wishes he could sleep that well. How do you like it? No, I don't mean Mabel the hairdresser. I mean my hair. The flamingo bob, I call it. Fancy, huh? Fancy. Well, here it is. I got it all ready for you. Autographed photograph of Max Magnificent. Look what it says. To an all-American lad from your idol, Max Magnificent. Fancy. Can I talk to you without the hairdresser? With my hair half up in curlers? You kidding, baby? Go ahead, talk to me. Mabel doesn't understand nothing except hair anyway. Talk. Talk to me. Maybe I'm being coincidental, Max. Oh! Mabel, comb the curls. Don't yank them out of my head. Oh. Uh, you're saying? A man I know came to see you wrestle last night when he was supposed to be worried, Max. A man named Alex Malvern. Oh, Max Magnificent welcomes him to the ever-growing list of his staunch admirers. Hey, I did that good. Yeah, and Alex Melvin worries because his fiancée, one Julie Dixon, is missing. I talked oh, to him. Oh, worried, huh? Then I got slugged. Then I wake up in the tender care of Rupert, valet for Max Magnificent. Hey, that makes a circle, huh? Go ahead, go ahead. This is real goose pimply talk. What's with Julie Dixon, Max? You know? Oh, asking me questions with no sense. Finish me, Mabel. This guy just got boring. What about Julie Dixon? Mabel, hand me the mirror. Julie Dixon. Oh, the flamingo bar. The fans will eat it up. You know something, you, mister, standing there? I can't hear you no more. You better go, mister. Mabel's got to sent me. The lavender, Mabel. Max Magnificent swept up the train of his magnificent brocaded robe. With a hairy paw swept up Mabel, his lady barber. With his other hairy paw motioned me magnificently to the door. And through it all maintained the magnificent grace and delicacy of a quaffed and perfumed gorilla. All that magnificence deserved some historical research. So I put a call through to Sergeant Ataglia to get on it. To bring me up to date on how and why and when and where Max and Rupert got so magnificent. So regally considerate of a poor beaten up policeman. And then I went back to the beginning... And the beginning was the lawyer, Alex Melbourne. Sure I can't offer you a drink, Danny? A noon cocktail to take the bitter taste out of your mouth? You've come a long way, Melvin. I can remember when it was a toss-up who'd get to where mayhem was first, you or me. <laughs> you mean I was a shyster, an ambulance chaser? It doesn't shame me, Danny. We all have to grub for nickels one way or another. Here's to you, Danny. I told you at the wrestling matches, it bothers us police about Julie Dixon. Gets worse all the time. So I see. Those black and blue marks, Danny. They hurt, don't they? I know they hurt, because I know. A girl you were going to marry. The papers said the brightest torch you ever carried. The paper said true. She disappears. You don't even cry. You don't even ask for help. Is that how it gets when you're big, Melbourne? You see the walnut paneling in my office, Danny? It cost a fortune. This private bar upholstered in Florentine leather. A fortune. Those golden girls, my secretaries, who wait on me hand and foot like I was a king. Also a fortune. None of this I got by asking anybody for help. 
So we've got nothing more to say to each other, huh, Danny? Glad you dropped in, though. I enjoyed that, Melvin. I speak only as a jury of one, but it was very impressive. I really enjoyed it. Out, Danny. I'm busy. You're going to throw me out, Melvin? Because that's how it'll have to be. There are lots of ways. One way, I could pick up the phone, talk to a friend. This friend listens when I talk. And because he listens, they could put you in the middle of Fifth Avenue, helping visitors dodge the terrible traffic. Do that, Maverick. Rick. Do it. Danny. Now you've got a good reason. Danny. A better one. Do it. Danny, Danny, just take it easy. Here's the phone, King. Call your friend. Forget it, Danny. Forget it. Forget I ever said it. I, I only thought it would be better if I found Julie in my own way. That's all there is to it, Danny, I swear. When did she disappear? Five days ago. We were in a cab going to a theater. The cab slowed down for a light, and all of a sudden Julie jumps out. I, I haven't seen her since. She didn't say anything? Leave anything? Just a bag with all the money in it. She didn't even say goodbye. She'd been acting funny for days. She was... Where's the bag? We're here. We're right, right here, Danny. Take it if you want. Yeah. Lipstick. Compact. Money. Hey. What, Danny? This newspaper clipping. This picture of Max Magnificent. You didn't tell me about that. Why should I? It doesn't mean anything. Julie liked wrestling matches. Maybe Max Magnificent was a hero. She made me take her to see him once. Yeah. Fix your $20 tie, Malvern. It got wrinkled somehow. It deserved a social call on Max Magnificent. But I was polite. I phoned first. Which was the proper thing to do because he wasn't at his hotel. The Magnificent had gone to the armory early, they said. He needed time to perfume his person and his dressing room before his performance tonight, they said. However, I could talk to his valet, they said. I said, no thanks. At the deserted armory, I followed Max's spoor down a long cavern and into a whitewashed dressing room. That brought me face to face with Rupert. Oh, Mr. Clover, how very nice of you to be here when I need you so desperately. Later, Rupert. Where's Max? Magnificent. He's there. That on the floor in the corner. He sleeps on concrete because he's so rugged. The Magnificent is not asleep, Mr. Clover. He's dead. What? You see, Mr. Clover? Yeah. Yeah, I see, Rupert. I didn't touch him, Mr. Clover, so you police would find him just as I found him only a moment ago. That is the custom, isn't it, Mr. Clover? Yes, Rupert. <laughs> that knife in his back. That means he was... Murdered? Murdered? <laughs> the Magnificent is dead, Mr. Clover. <laughs> Long live the Magnificent. <laughs> Listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway is a place that can fool you, can walk by the lost and the broken and the dying without batting an eye. But when one of its own lies dead, Broadway tears its collective breast, dons the sackcloth and ashes, and sends up a shrieking lament that can be heard round the world. And for a little while, you believe it. You believe Broadway is heartbroken because death came on a man who called himself Max Magnificent and stuck a knife in his back. You believe Broadway has found torment because it lost a Cinderella girl named Julie Dixon. Then you take a good look at Broadway and you know you're out of your mind. But you stay with it, because you're a cop. And as a cop, you're Broadway's conscience. And as a conscience, you've got a helper, namely Sergeant Gino Tartaglia. Danny, sometimes when I can't go to sleep nights, I analyze my relationship with you. And? And I have come to the, to the conclusion that I am what is technically known as a mother's helper. <laughs> and I'm very proud of you, Gino. Ah, Danny, stop it. <clears throat> well, item one. The boys in the lab say that after a detailed check of the fingerprints of Max Magnificent, 
He turns out to be an ordinary human being with a name as common as Clover or Tartaglia. Oh? Yeah, honest, Danny. Max Magnificent was none other than Joe Warner. Joe Warner, huh? And Joe Warner was none other than who, Tartaglia? Oh, a guy who we once picked up for attempted blackmail. Badge again. Who was the girl? Uh, that we don't know. But we're still working on it. Item two... The missing girl, Julie Dixon, is known to have withdrawn her entire savings from the Corn Exchange Bank the day before said Julie Dixon disappeared. How much savings? A goodly sum, $3,000. As you say, goodly. Maybe that explains why she didn't need her bag when she jumped out of Melbourne's cab. Yeah, possibly, Danny. Well, may I continue? Oh, please do. Item three. Detective Mugovan is even now on the tail of the famous and renowned lawyer Alex Malvin. And Detective Kenny is even now on the tail of Rupert the Valet. And Julie Dixon's description? The description? Description, Tartaglia. It's out. Any reports on it? Uh, no, no, Danny. Well, get on it, Tartaglia. Check again. Every railway station, every pawn shop, every everything. You'll remember, won't you, Tartaglia? Oh, I promise, Danny. Oh, I, I just remembered. I forgot something. Oh, I'm glad for you, Tartaglia. Oh, thank you, Danny. I just remembered you got a call from someone named Sophie Wojcikowski. Huh? Yeah, Sophie Wojcikowski. She skates on roller skates at the roller derby at Madison Square Garden. She says, come meet her at uh, 8 tonight. There's something about Julie Dixon. She said, uh, Danny, Danny, can I help with a wife for God? I got so much on my mind. Mrs. Tartaglia, the kids, I don't see see me? If your name's Sophie Wojciechowski, I am. Well, you don't have a scorecard, huh? Else you'd know. Everybody knows number 12 is Sophie Wojciechowski. I'm Danny Clover. Oh. What about Julie Dixon, Sophie? Oh, Julie and me used to borrow our skate key from the same guy. How long ago was that? Oh, years and years and years. I mean, we grew up together practically. Then we grew up, then she got married, then she went away, then I never heard of her. Then yesterday came. Yesterday was something special? Not especially special, except a guy called me upon the telephone and asked me if I knew the whereabouts of Julie. I told him no, because I don't. Then the guy said a bad word and hung up. What guy? The guy I was talking to upon the telephone. Oh, you mean his name. Uh -uh, He didn't say. Now, let's go back a little bit. You said Julie was married to a man named Joe Warner? That I don't know. Except I heard from sources close to the roller rink that he deserted her. Ran away to Texas, I heard. This was about... Three years ago. Then the reason you called was to tell me about the phone call. Well, not exactly. You see, I saw Julie yesterday. Later, after the guy called upon the telephone. Huh? Sure, she said she was broke. She came to borrow some money. How much did you lend her? Not a cent, because that's how much I had at the time. She said thank you and walked out of my life again. (coughs) Oh. The woman's team will take their places. One minute. Hey, look, I gotta go now. That's all I know, Mr. Clover. Come on. I watched Sophie clatter onto the track, watched her rabbit punch one of the contenders, trip another, sharp right cross to another, and then Sophie Wojciechowski had a clear field. It wasn't fun anymore, so I got out. And I began to add it up. Julie's husband had deserted her, Sophie said. And in Julie's bag had been a picture of Max Magnificent, who was Joe Warner. And Julie had gone through $3,000 fast even for a girl like Julie. And the sum could be blackmail and murder. Except one factor was missing from the equation. Julie Dixon. And at headquarters, Sergeant Tataglia was being mother's helper like anything. Danny, I think what we boys got on this Julie Dixon will help you like anything. Oh? Yeah. Now, sit down, Danny. Sit down. This is big. You ready? We have discovered that Julie Dixon was married to Joe Warner, later Max Magnificent. And there is no indication that a divorce happened in the family. Uh, you're right, Tartaglia. You've made a big discovery. Uh, thank you, Danny. Thank you. But uh, I have here another item that is not so happy. Rupert the valet has disappeared from the tale of Kenny the detective. What? Don't go away, Tartaglia. Oh, where would I go? Danny Clover speaking. Uh, Mr. Clover, I am Howard Jones mentor of a sanctuary you people call a pawn shop. Yeah, we'll try to do better. Is that all you want? <laughs> Not what I want, Mr. Clover. What you people want. Julie Dixon. She was in my uh, place not an hour ago. How do you know it was Julie Dixon? She fits the description. Lots of women might. True, true. Uh, 
true, but uh, she pawned a platinum and diamond bracelet with her initials on the back of it. I gave her $50, but only because I'm a friend of Pam. Okay, okay. What name did she give you? Mary Smith. Address? Hotel at 2617 East 8th Street. Thank you, Howard Jones. Tartaglia. Yeah, Danny. Don't go away. I won't. Uh, hey, Danny, don't forget your hat. <laughs> You the desk clerk? No, I'm the scrub lady, Mac. But I got word there's no vacancy, so go try another flea bag, huh, Mac? This one suits me fine. I'm looking for a girl. Oh, in that case, you want the Lonely Hearts Club. Three blocks down, up two flights, tell them I recommend you for membership. A girl, Julie Dixon. What room is she in, scrub lady? For this, I got two answers. I doubt if one of our guests, if she has a name, Julie Dixon, would sign this same name on the register. Answer number two is why should I answer you at all, Mac? Good question. Good answer? Plain clothes, Dick. With badge to match, eh? Oh, impresses me. Tell me how much. This much, Mac. I am a room clerk in this hostelry. We have a guest, a gorgeous doll occupying our diplomat suit. It's possible this girl could be the girl whom you of the gendarmerie... What room? Try number 18. That's the suit with the washstand. If you want room service, just scream, huh, policeman? Get away from here. Your name, Julie Dixon? I said get away from here. Get away before I make it real tough for you. Go ahead. You ask for it, mister. Help! Help! Somebody help! Such a pretty dress. Ripping it won't help it at all. Somebody, please! 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 That's me, police. What? Badge and all. Look. Okay, let's go inside. Police. That's right, Julie. Do you want to tell me now or later? Doesn't matter a whole lot. No. No, it doesn't. Nothing matters anymore. What do you want? Not so much. Just fill me in. You were paying blackmail. To whom? To a nursemaid. To a nursemaid to my husband. A nursemaid who called himself Rupert. He had something to sell you? Like this. My husband, Joe Warner. Joe Warner, a Max Magnificent, whatever you want to call him. I thought he was dead. We were never divorced, and I thought he was dead. What made you think your husband was dead when he wasn't? Papers. Joe was in Texas at the time. You know the time the tanker blew up? Texas City? A disaster in 47, huh? The papers listed a man named Joe Warner dead. I was certain it was my husband. He was in Texas City then. Yeah. They still don't know how many people died there, or who. So I met Alex Melvin... And I fell in love with him, and he fell in love with me, and we were going to get married. That's the way I am when I fall in love with a man, and he falls in love with me. So Joe changes his name to Max Magnificent, becomes a wrestler with a hairdo, and hires himself a valet named Rupert. Max, hairdo, and valet show up in New York, right? Yes. Rupert came to me and said he wanted money to keep my first marriage quiet. More than that, Julie. It was the kind of marriage you had, wasn't it? A partnership for blackmail. A partnership to work the badger game. That's why you paid him the $3,000 you drew from the bank. That's why. It was worth that to keep Melvin from knowing what I used to be. But it was no good, so I ran away. I ran away and I've been running ever since. You've got nothing to worry about anymore, Julie. Except one thing. Whether Alex will have me now? That? Maybe that. But the other thing... Your husband's been murdered. You had the motive, the opportunity, maybe. And you're running away. Murderers do that. I've been terribly impolite. I've been listening. You don't mind that, do you, Mr. Clover? Glad to have you aboard, Rupert. Your name was being bandied about. I'll kill him. So help me, I'll kill him! Take it easy, Julie. Thank you, sir. Else I would have killed her before your very eyes. Like you killed Max? Yes, of course. He had the body of an ox, but his insides were not fortitudinous at all. Yellow is the word for Max Magnificent. (laughs) I laugh at the name. (laughs) Why did you come here, Rupert? I've been following you, Mr. Clover. I want you to be 
happy before you die. Now that you've found Julie, you'd find me. Then you'd try to have me executed for murder. I just couldn't stand that. One more thing, Rupert, just to make me a happy man. You said Max was yellow. I said it because I meant it. He suddenly changed his mind about blackmailing Julie. Let the kid alone. She deserves a break. Those were his very words. I tried to argue him out of his faint heart. There were words. He had muscles. I had a knife. (laughs) I won the argument. Julie, you have such poor taste in husbands. You ruined it. You ruined everything! Julie, watch out. You fool! I told her! Yeah, you told her? Good. Rupert crashed into the washstand. The gun clattered out of his hands. And then, like some crazed animal, he scurried for it in the half-light. So there was only one thing to do. Then I bent over Julie to try to help her. To somehow ease the pain of the wound in her shoulder. And she did something strange. She shook her head and motioned me away. And in her eyes, there was something that could have been agony or happiness or something I didn't know about. When the ambulance came, she walked into it and lay down and fell asleep. Rupert was different. He screamed and tore at my face. So I had to give him the anesthetic once more. Broadway's wearing its harlequin clothes, and it winks an eye and beckons. And a pale and hungry girl walks its pavements like a queen, because Broadway's a dream street. And a fat man stands with begging eyes, because he just found out his last dream didn't come true. It's a laugh or a cry, with nothing in between. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia. The musical score was composed and conducted by Alexander Courage, and the program was produced by Elliot Lewis and directed by Gordon T. Hughes. The cast tonight included Vivi Janis, Bill Johnstone, Virginia Gregg, Jay Novello, Junius Matthews, and Larry Dobkin. <laughs> Joe Walters speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.